Get ready to embrace debate. First Take starts now. Coming up on the First Take podcast, should the NBA now ban Donald Sterling's wife from Clippers games? And Peyton Manning or Derek Jeter, who has had the better career so far? Plus, which NFL draft prospect is being compared to Michael Jordan? All that and more coming up on the First Take podcast, which starts right now. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Take. Carrie Champion with the fellas. Get Bayless and Stephen A. Smith. We're all in house. Hey, 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 hey. What's Good going on? How y'all doing? Good to see What's you. What's going man. on? What's How up, are you? you, darling? How's everything going? Good. No complaints. What a weekend, man. It's been a good oh. week. Huh. What happened Best this weekend? First. What happened Saturday Best night? Like, there was a fight. I don't know what There was happened. a fight. Best first I, was round. that really Floyd Mayweather? That or was that an imposter? No, it was Floyd uh, Mayweather. Let's talk about it. Well, yes, of course. Coming up on the show today, Floyd Mayweather had a fight with Madonna. You watched it. Yes, I did. Okay, well. Yes, I did. We'll but it. I was also oh. caught up in the best first round playoff action of, of postseason oh. basketball I have ever seen in my career. Hey, right. it, it was almost too great for me. Right. Yeah. Well, one Until of the yesterday. gentlemen says that uh, Floyd was distracted. The other gentleman, well, we'll get his reaction uh, coming up a little later on in the show. Plus, Doc Rivers speaks with our Mike Wilbon about what he should and should not have known about one Donald Sterling. We will talk about that as well. But first, Stephen A just talked about it. The Western Conference moves to the semis and the Clippers and the Thunder are up first. Both teams extremely, extremely drained. One emotionally, the other physically. So we asked this question, since they are playing together, who wins that series? Stephen A. Smith, for you. Are we talking the Clippers here? We in are. The, in the Oklahoma City Thunder. We are. Listen, I picked the Oklahoma City Thunder to come out of the West. You're in a tough spot here. And I'm know? in a very, very tough <laughs> spot because my heart is with the Clippers. Oh. I'm not going to oh. lie to you. I, to I, I wouldn't heart mind. overhead. Yes. I, wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind seeing the Clippers go to the, uh, to the NBA Finals. Okay. I would love it. But I still have to go with OKC. What? In this you, particular you just matchup. picked the Clippers on Friday. You <laughs> picked the Clippers to win the West. I don't know. Remember, remember? What? Remember, y'all can't do that to me. Can't He's do that right. to you, me. Know, you, you can't know. do that to me. No, what we, no, what we some, said yeah. was He's we scared. got emotional and we talked about how <sighs> if it were today, <sighs> that's what we said. <sighs> that's what we said. You had picked San Antonio to come out of the West. I picked OKC. But we talked about that particular day. All right, and that's all we were doing because we were having fun with that. Uh, Don't sit there and switch you can't up. Do that to him. Here's the deal. I can do that to him. You, no, he's doing it to me. No, not at all. Not at all. Because listen, we're all over the place with the West, Skip. Because if you're talking, I'm not. About, if you're talking about. I'm right where I was. Well, listen. I'm I'm where I was six months well, ago. Well, here, well, to twelve months ago. Well, but that's because you're always speaking with your heart when it comes to no, the San Antonio no, Spurs. It's my head. Me personally, I think San Antonio's got the best shot to beat Miami. But I, I think their kryptonite is OKC. When I look at the Los Angeles Clippers, even though I think they can give everybody a run for their money, my problem with the Clippers is free throw shooting on the part of DeAndre Jordan, a person that I literally and firmly believe is the best big man in the game if he can hit free throws. The problem is if he can't hit free throws, you can't really have him in there against teams that are efficient come fourth quarter mm -hmm. because he's going to go to the free throw line and he's not going to deliver for you. He's average, he averaged 14, almost 15 rebounds a game in the, in the first round series, almost five blocks a game in the first round series. The boy is big time. The problem is his free throw shooting. And against OKC, Skip Bayless, with a Durant, with a, rest, with a Westbrook and these guys, regardless of the mistakes that you're going to make, Chris Paul, going up against a Russell Westbrook and that athleticism. That could be problematic. Mm -hmm. But the other big issue is DeAndre Jordan and his ability to hit free throws because if nothing else, OKC can hit theirs. And that is why I have to look at them in a seven-game series. I can see this going seven, but I still would have to go with OKC in seven. So I jumped out of bed this morning thinking, this is really going to be fun because – I, I'm going to go with the Thunder in this series. And my man, Stephen A. Smith, he has boarded the Clippers bandwagon. And now I can only look back at Saturday night and think, well, if the Clippers had won by 25 at home, you'd probably still be riding the bandwagon. But it was a close game. It, it, I expected it, it to be close. Okay, who didn't? I thought it'd go to overtime. And, and it wasn't like end of the world kind of close. The Clippers pretty much won, I thought, fairly convincingly, even though it got a little bit hairy late but they were clearly a little better than Golden State. I do not think they're better than the Oklahoma City Thunder, so I'll at least go you one better on the pick. 
I got Thunder in six games, and I'm tempted to go five games because I think they're that much better. In fact, I'll just do it. I'm on the record. You've ticked me Why off not? already. <laughs> five. Thunder in five games. And if we keep going long enough, I might pick a sweep in this. And, I, yeah, let's be balanced about this. Obviously, Saturday night, the Oklahoma City Thunder got a huge break because the NBA shockingly and wrongly tossed out Zach Randolph for a game seven. Uh -huh. A game seven? game seven? For a little push in the face of Steven Adams? I mean, give me a break. I, I thought Jeff Van Gundy was sensational on air. So just saying, I. please rethink it. Just, just back off and say, oh, we overreacted last night. Which, and you were strong about it, too. But they didn't because they won't. Once they dig in, they're not going to change their mind because Pandora's box would fly open then. But in this case, it was a big break for the Thunder. But I'm going to tell you what I saw on Saturday night and why I will pick the Thunder in five games against Chris Paul and company. I'm going to say it again. To me, the man in Oklahoma City, to me again on Saturday night, was not Kevin Durant. It was his little buddy, his little running mate, Russell Westbrook just dominated that basketball game. Now, he, he can be the biggest reason they win and the biggest reason they lose. And for a while, it looked like he was going to be the reason they lost because he had four turnovers in the first quarter alone. And Scott Brooks, to his credit, sat him down, cooled him off, mm -hmm. redirected him, yep. and shoved him back into the fray. And does he not play with a rage to win? <clears throat> well, look at this line, Stephen A. Yep. 27 points, 16 assists. And ten, a team leading 10 rebounds, including four more offensive rebounds, where I think he's better on the offensive glass than anybody on that team is. In fact, I'm starting to think he's a better rebounder than Ibaka is, who had only four total rebounds in this game. Russell Westbrook is a terror, and I do not think Chris Paul can deal with Russell Westbrook. And I'm going to say this again. The best thing that happened to Kevin Durant was that headline, Mr. Unreliable. It, it took him out of the fear of failure category into the rage to win category. It made him angry. It made his teammate, teammates refocus and have his back and say, this is outrageous. How dare you? It was outrageous. It, it, yeah. well, okay, I don't think it was. But again, I think in the big picture, that headline deserves some credit for refocusing this basketball team and letting them take care of business that they surely t should have taken care of, I thought, two or three games before this. But obviously, Durant and Westbrook were awful up to that point. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they're going to be awful from this point forward, and I think they will be way too much for your used-to-be Clippers that you used to love. <laughs> your used-to-be yeah. Clippers. A couple of yeah. things I want to throw out there. Number one, just to go off the, yeah. the, you know, the headline. I didn't, know, I didn't like the headline because mm -hmm. it didn't specify that they were talking about Memphis. That's not, that's not the, I don't yeah. even blame the sports editor for that. I don't blame the writers for that. Some copy editor there tried to get imaginative. I'm sure it wasn't, it wasn't malicious to the point that it's being embraced, but nevertheless, you got to mind yourself with that. I also had a problem, believe it or not, with Sam Presti because then he talked about, you know, clearly they were talking about basketball and, you, and you try to take it to another level. Tornado uh, victims. To, 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 I mean, yeah. come on, Sam Presti. Okay, come on. He's, he's a class guy and he's doing a fantastic job, but that's ridiculous. You know the newspaper weren't going, that, we're not, they weren't going in that direction. Yeah, that's a bit extreme on his part, really ridiculous on his part. But also, Zach Randolph getting suspended for that game seven. I did not think he should have been suspended. They did show that his fist was closed. It was a reaction on his part. I just think you let that go. You find him or whatever. It's a game seven, my God. You're going to decide you're, it? You're, yeah. you're asking people in Memphis to come out there, support the team. You've got an epic series with about four overtime games. And yeah. you're going to take Zach Randolph out for something like that? I thought that was a bit extreme on the part of the NBA. But in the same breath, I don't want to absolve Zach Randolph from this. Worst case scenario, you're losing the game, but you're up 3-2. You're not yep. down 3-2. It's not like you're going home for the summer. You got a game seven coming up. Worst case scenario, yep. you got a game seven coming up. You can't put yourself in a position to jeopardize that in any way. This is the kind of problem. When you talk about the league and the negativity that comes associated with it, when you're talking about young men yep. and their ability to harness that testosterone yep. and keep themselves under control, this is the kind of stuff people are alluding to. Because when something like that happens, you trying to tell me you could have composed yourself and, and be ready for Game 7? Okay. You're going to get yourself ejected for a Game 7? Okay, now you're making a case for the NBA. No, no, no. Thought... I, I don't think I am because I'm, I'm saying... 
They should not have done it. But, Skip, we also know that there are plenty of occasions where people have been suspended, where we question whether or not the NBA did the right thing. If you're a player in the NBA, you've got to know that. And you've got to make sure you avoid If I'm the city of Memphis, I'm furious at Zach Randolph right now. Okay, and I love Zach. I think you just you said if it had been before game two, you would have suspended Zach without even thinking twice no, about no, no. it. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying because I don't believe he should have been suspended for that. But what I'm saying is – is that despite the fact that I believe the NBA was wrong in suspending him, you have to know Personally. something like that is possible, and you've got a Game 7. Worst case scenario is you've got a Game 7 coming up. You can't put yourself in that position. Mm. You've got to know better. Mm. That's all I'm saying. You've got to keep yourself under control because as disgusted as I am with the NBA, if I'm the city of Memphis, I'm like, Z. You averaging 18 points a game. You need some bench warmer. Mm -hmm. We need you. You can't let that happen to you. And that's all I'm okay. saying with that. Now you look at OKC, Kevin Durant. You talk about the undesirable headline. Skip, I believe you. Absolutely the best thing to happen. Because now, to me, more so than his troops rallying around him, and the organization rallying around him, and people like myself and others who recognize his greatness rallying around him, Kevin Durant needed to step up. He needed to take the bull by the horn and say, excuse me, have you forgot who I am and what I can okay. do? He needed to do that. And if that's what served as inspiration, so be it. Okay, so last quick point. Yeah. Basketball-wise, mm -hmm. how do the Clippers stop Westbrook number one and Durant number two? Who well, can, who has any hope of? Well, first of all, you're not stopping them per se. But the fact that you have DeAndre Jordan and Blake Griffin on your front line basically strips you of any potency in the paint, even though that's not the Thunder's game anyway. Now they're going to become more of a perimeter shooting team, especially if Doc Rivers does what I think he's going to do, which is emphasize getting back on defense and turning them into a half-court team. Mm -hmm. When you do that, because I don't see good enough spacing and I don't see good enough ball movement on continuous occasions, you essentially turn them into a perimeter shooting team or one or two. The key to this series is going to be Russell Westbrook and how he's capable of taking advantage of Chris Paul, not I agree. because of his height and his athleticism, but also because of that hamstring injury that's been bothering Chris Paul. you got to be ready 100% to go up against Russell Westbrook you? if you're an opposing guard. And Chris Paul is undersized. He's tough, and he's a steals leader. So he can create some turnovers because they did that against Golden State, which will help the Clippers. Mm -hmm. But in the end, I think in a seven-game series with home court advantage, although I can see both teams stealing one on the other's home court, mm -hmm. I think ultimately it gets back to a game seven in OKC, and that's where OKC closes the deal. And my bottom line is Serge Ibaka and to a certain degree Stephen Adams, who's no small human not, being, not at all. Okay? Not he, at all. he knows how to play and how to block shots. Are and going to dirty. Huh, what's that? <laughs> he can, dirty. But, but I mean, they and needed dirty. a little bit of that. Bit. They need okay? a little bit of that. I'm not right. knocking them for it. I, I think they're going to turn Lob City a little more into Sob City this time. <laughs> oh, Just watch. Well, Just well, watch. Well, You're well, not going to well, see. You got to remember the athleticism that you talk about with Serge Ibaka. Because you have DeAndre Jordan down there catching alley oops, yep. Serge is not going to be able to focus yep. on everybody else the way he normally does because you're going to have okay. DeAndre Jordan to deal with. You both agree that Mr. Unreliable motivated Kevin Durant. He mentioned yesterday in the press conference or after the game on Saturday night that he was motivated by the media, so congrats on that. Um, we didn't get to talk about this, about the alleged uh, scuffle that happened between the Clippers and the Warriors. Maybe we'll touch on that a little later on in the show. But there was a pay-per-view fight. Can we talk about that? Floyd Mayweather, Marcos Madonna. Did you guys watch that? Floyd Mayweather. We, we told you we watched uh, it. Already. Why are you asking us again? Well, four again, Just ask, just ask Get to the question. That's right. Just one more time. Gentlemen, relax. You have ten more minutes to discuss this. Uh-huh. Why are you getting an attitude? Why are you getting an attitude? He's trying to set us up. I mean, no surprise who won the match. Listen to this. <laughs> you know, I got a cut early on in my career from a headbutt. This happened, I think, in the fourth, fourth round from a headbutt. But um, I told the fans, I told the people, everybody, that I wasn't going to do a lot of moving. I told them I was going to do a lot of fighting. I wanted to give the fans their money's worth. I wanted to give the people that's on pay-per-view their money's worth. So that's what I went out there and did tonight. Uh, we fought. We fought. And he was, he's, a hell of, he's a hell of a competitor. A fun fight to watch, 117-112. That's what I had it. But a competitive 117-112. A give and take 117-112. Mayweather showed why he's 46-0 and now. His defense is great. 
but he also showed why he can be beat. He plays defense too much. He allows guys to get into him too much. And then when you get a referee like Weeks who allowed everything to go on, well, you had a little bit of a Donnybrook, but a fun fight and worthy of a rematch. Worthy of a rematch, so says our Teddy Atlas. The boys are anxious today. Uh, your boy was distracted. He admitted that. Or no, not really. Those were reports. What happened, Stephen A., to your boy? Money Mayweather. Uh-huh. The best boxer on the planet Earth. Uh-huh. He used to be. Oh, stop it. Still is. <laughs> in my estimation, put forth his worst performance that I've seen in years. Uh-huh. I was thoroughly unimpressed by what I saw from Floyd Mayweather. He didn't look as sharp. He didn't look as quick. Uh, he didn't give Madonna the boxing lesson I expected Madonna to receive. Now, he came out there swinging. He tried. And Floyd made him miss enough, that's for sure. But Floyd looked distracted. Now, you know, I was, I was sitting there, and I mentioned this uh, before the y'all uh, uh, last week when somebody was joking around with me talking about Father Time is undefeated and, and somebody else came along and said, so are women. And, you know, it, in, in other words, what they were talking about is with men, you can get distracted. Floyd acknowledged he was distracted. We don't need to get into why, but it involved Miss Jackson, you know, which he, he was on the record alluding to on several occasions. And so as a result of that, just days before the fight, that's not a distraction that you can go into the ring with and be 100%. You just can't. You know, and, and, and for those that think I'm joking, please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm dead serious about that. That doesn't mean you can't perform. It doesn't mean you can't get the job done. Floyd performed enough to get the job done and to get the victory. But he was thoroughly unimpressive compared to what I'm seeing. And I'm going to bring his father into the equation because his father, Floyd Mayweather Sr., is an elite trainer. This man knows boxing. And one of the things, Roger, his uncle, was special for years. But then his father came back in due to health issues on Roger's part. And the father saw him take too many hits against Miguel Cotto a couple of years back and said, you don't need to be doing that anymore. And got Floyd back to being the defensive artist that he had been for the vast majority of his career. And that's who we had been seeing. That's certainly who we saw against Canelo Alvarez up until this fight. Now, you can maul, uh, people have tried to maul Floyd Mayweather in the past, tried to suffocate him. I've seen that stuff, those tactics utilized against him, but I've never seen it affect him the way he seemed affected Saturday night. And he was affected from opening tap, from the opening bell. And it was because he did not come, look at his demeanor, look at how he walked into the ring, Look at his facial expression. Look at his body language. You know I know Floyd. Skip, I've been watching him for years. He wasn't himself. He wasn't himself, and, and he, almost, he almost lost because of it because the fight to me was a hell of a lot closer than the score indicated. Mm. Are we finished with all the Floyd excuses? Oh, because right. I got to tell no, you, went, you, you know what? You, you duck and dodge as much as Floyd does yeah, in the yeah, ring. Yeah, yeah, you know? Said he was well, okay. I ain't worried about Skip. Skip <laughs> always feel that way about anything I say about Floyd. He'll I, get over it someday. Oh. Here's what I saw. This is just little old me okay. watching my little pay-per-view on Saturday pay night. Yeah, right. Actually, it was Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. right? I saw exactly why Floyd money or Floyd may or may not weather keeps running from Manny Pacquiao because he spent most of the night running from Madonna. How many times did he run to the ropes? What was that all about? The first round, I'm thinking, are you going to try to pull the rope a dope on Madonna and hope that he just punches himself out in the first couple of rounds? Because the kid wasn't going to punch himself out. He was wailing on Floyd on the ropes. He kept chopping away with that overhand right. I tried to hit him in the back of the head. Yeah, he, he might have got him a couple times a in the back of the head because Floyd was ducking so much on the ropes. What are you supposed trying to do? To, well, what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed listen to, listen to this. Got to duck. Madonna throws 858 punches to Floyd's 426. Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. Floyd's just in the corner just cowering over there. I'm thinking, what are you doing, Floyd? And what happened was Floyd came close to losing this fight. One judge called it a draw. Well, that, drug, a that, draw. That, that judge a needs draw. to be drug tested. Okay. There was no draw involved. Anybody who saw the fight knew better than that. Well, okay. I, I was only fueled by Diet Mountain Dew at this point okay. at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. But 
I had it 115, 113 Floyd. I will give you Floyd seven rounds to five rounds. And Floyd run, won most of the last I few I rounds. I can't refute that. That's exactly okay. what my score okay. was. Okay, thank you very much. So I look at Madonna's face after the fight. It looked like he just returned from vacation, <laughs> like like he just been to the spa. Okay. I mean, seriously. Oh, I mean, I mean, he went. There, there wasn't a mark on his face. A lot of grease. And, and a lot you, of grease know, you know what? Floyd popped him a couple times in the middle of the ring when we saw a little flash of the old Floyd, but it's it's pillow fight punches. It's it's nothing. It doesn't. Madonna didn't even flinch. He's just coming right on and coming right on and backing right up against the ropes. And how dare Floyd before the fight accuse? Pacquiao of losing pop in his punches, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then I see Floyd look like he's 40 years old. Seriously, his body looks good. Yeah. He, he still looks chiseled. He looks, still looks great. Cut. He has yeah, body. the body looks good, but the results not so good. I'm just saying, what was that all about? It, it, was it really off the, you know, out of the ring? I definitely think it was, Skip, because the activity on a part of Floyd Mayweather Jr. But what did I hear there. before the fight? Floyd is the one guy who can focus in the ring. It's nothing bothers him. You know what? That, well, you, did, listen, yeah. listen. You, didn't hey. hear, you didn't hear that when you heard the stuff that you heard last week. We talked you about it. Yeah, but yeah. you sort of suspected. Uh, you sort of suspected that he wasn't going to be himself. It's just that Madonna was so slow. You're like, I be, he'll be lucky to touch Floyd. But I'm telling you right now, Floyd did not seem remotely as interested in fighting as he normally okay. does. So, and I don't, so what I think do we hear right away in the, the post-fight ring? Uh, we hear Floyd say, <laughs> I wanted to give my fight my fans a great yeah. fight. We that. hear that every time. I want to give my we fans hear, a great hear, fight. We hear that, really? we hear that every time. Really? We hear that, we so hear that every just time. just taking it easy on the 12-1 to one underdog. That's what we hear that every fight. Yeah. Saturday night, I, f I felt for the first time that was a lie. Thank you. The fact of the matter is that he did it. He did it. It wasn't a great. It, listen, if it were a great fight, it, it was. If you want to call it a great fight, it was because of Floyd's inactivity more so than anything else. Because Floyd made it far more interesting than it needed to be because he did not seem like he wanted to be there. I, what I saw, what I am accustomed to seeing from Floyd Mayweather Jr., he should have picked that man apart. I agree. That man should not have been able to touch Floyd. Right. And the fact is, he was. Because Floyd, I'm telling you right now, if you go back, you can simply watch an entrance into the ring along with pre-fight introductions. Even that was different from what you're accustomed to seeing from Floyd Mayweather Jr. You know what he seemed like? When I say this, tell me whether or not y'all agree with this. Floyd appeared as if he was somewhat shy or, dare I say, embarrassed about being in a public setting. He seemed like he didn't want well, to be I, there. Who wouldn't be embarrassed being with Justin Bieber? But that's but, all. Yeah, no, he's no. done that before. Justin, I, he's done that how before. Can you, how can you he defend that? that? He's done that before. You he's can't done defend that. that. You, you cannot you defend that. Thank you. He doesn't. He <laughs> didn't see. Now I don't believe there's I, there's no doubt in my mind that Floyd would make a mess for this. I still believe that Floyd would pick Manny Pacquiao apart oh, because that's a fight he would nope. have to be up for. Oh, yeah. But I'm just saying to you that okay. he did not seem. So, Interested Wait, but now, what do you mean embarrassed? this Saturday what do you mean night. Embarrassed? Well, listen, and I'm not joking. I'm dead serious about this. If you read and hear the stuff that was out there about what was going on with him personally leading up to the fight, it's the kind of thing that makes a brother not want to really talk to anybody. Oh. It, it just you just don't feel like talking. You don't feel like being around people. You don't feel like working. Mm -hmm. you, you, you appear, he appeared, I don't want to say demoralized, melancholy might be a more appropriate word. Mm. He didn't seem like himself. Mm. He didn't seem interested in coming to work Saturday. To me, the Floyd Mayweather you saw Saturday night is a dude that showed up to just do his job and go home. Okay. Not to really be Floyd. Okay. I saw the difference. I saw it with my own two eyes. You're not Some people it. thought that the retirement talk last week was legit. Okay. That it was emotional. He cried. He had tears in his eyes. So am I to, to believe now that fighting is no longer a priority yes. with this guy? When he fought, I interviewed him before he fought the GOAT, Guerrero. Um, then he fought Canelo Alvarez, and he was definitely ready for that fight. But when you've been through what he's been through, you know, you got to remember, you've got incarceration, you get out of being incarcerated, and your man, somebody that you went on the record publicly and swore by, 50 Cent, 
Y'all disbanded. Yep. Y'all separated. Yep. And, and, and then you see him, and you got her name is Miss Jackson, and, you know, he was talking about marrying this woman and all of this other stuff, and then that falls apart. This is all a matter of public record. You know I don't give people personal mm -hmm. business, but this is all a matter of public record. You've got the multitude of those things going on with you. Mm -hmm. You are human. It can affect you. And okay. I think there's no way that Madonna affected him to that level. Okay. He didn't want to be there. But he wasn't distracted enough to go ahead and make a handshake agreement for a rematch with Madonna. Right. And it would have to be, I guess, in September because that's his scheduled next fight. So Amir Khan is sitting out there who would be a oh, big please, threat. Please. Oh, come on. Please, he would. Khan, you know, he would. He's got, he's got Amir hands. Khan, stop yeah. it. And Garcia, this, Garcia, I mean, that, that boy could fight. Be. But don't bring okay. me Amir Khan. Well, I'm just saying he's please. the next one in line. I mean, that, that's okay. a waste of time. Okay. That's a waste so, of time. So the point is, the one guy who's not a waste of time is Manny Pacquiao. Mm -hmm. What are we like now, two years away from Manny Pacquiao yeah, at true. best? No. I'm serious. Hey. I'm, that's what we're looking at with the rematch with Madonna. You tweeted Congratulations, that. Congratulations, Floyd. That's what you tweeted. Another rematch pushes him away from yeah. Pacquiao. Yeah. So you think? Well, I, it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's exactly what the doctor ordered for Floyd Mayweather. Maybe Dr. Phil ordered. It's a, lot, it's, a, it's a lot going on, man. He just needs to step away from the ring for a little while, mm. get himself together. Mm. He'll be all right. He just didn't show. He, Floyd Mayweather Jr., I don't care what he says. Mm -hmm. I know how great he is. He didn't show up Saturday night. All right. That wasn't him. All of us had heard Donald Sterling stories. Mm hmm how did it get that far and who's responsible for letting it get that far no one you know um you know like i've always like we, we I've, I've heard that a lot like uh why didn't somebody know why didn't somebody do that why does someone else have to take the blame for someone else you know it, it just seems like the the target should be on the on the the guy who offended not anyone else um so like we've heard the stories but we never heard it we never saw never it. Never on tape. It was never on tape. And once it became on tape, then you had proof. You know, um, so once we had proof, the, the league and, and not only the league, just people in general took action and, uh, and got results. And that was Mike Wilbon speaking with Doc Rivers on what he knew or why it was hard to believe that he or the team or other people didn't know anything about Donald Sterling's history. Question Stephen A., should he have known? No, I really don't feel that way. Um, you know, as I've had to talk about this over the last week or so, I've not only been asked that question about Doc Rivers, I've been asked that question about the NBA. And what I would like to remind people of is this. A lot of times people are preoccupied with their own lives, mm -hmm. their own direct communication, you really don't go by what you hear too much, not just because most of the time it's innuendo, but the other side of it is what are you supposed to do about it exactly? Donald Sterling was being sued by the Department of Justice of the United States of America, and even they couldn't get him to acknowledge for the record that he was guilty of the allegations levied against him. Mm -hmm. There was a settlement, whether it's 2.17 or 2.7 million, whatever you want to, uh, whatever number you want to throw out there. There was a settlement where there was no admission of guilt. And on top of it all, um, as he bragged about, the insurance paid for it. Mm -hmm. um, D. Elgin Baylor case, a former executive of his, one of the all-time great players in a Hall of Famer, served under Donald Sterling for 22 years before ultimately suing him. Didn't stop him from working for the man for 22 years, but you sued him and ultimately lost because the courts deemed that you didn't have a strong enough case. Well, what is Doc Rivers supposed to do? Turn down $7 million a year in control of basketball operations? What is Chris Paul supposed to do? Turn down $107 million? What are these players supposed to do? What is Blake Griffin supposed to do? Turn down $95 million? I mean, in the NBA itself, I'm going to reiterate what I said last week. Y'all folks are acting as if this guy wants to own an NBA team and there's this questionable history associated with him. No, he was already in as one of the owners. So what case can you make to get rid of him? The answer was there was no case 
to get rid of him. And so because of that, it is what it is. And you have to deal with it. And Doc Rivers saying the point that he made, I think, is incredibly poignant. Why is it that other people should be blamed mm. for what Donald Sterling did? We hear stuff about people all the time. But unless there's unequivocal proof, you don't have it. You know, I read Dan Levitard's column, and he's talking about, you know, the convenient hypocrisy of it all and how there was stuff out there and, you know, people didn't report it. Bomani Jones made an incredibly strong argument because he wrote about Donald Sterling's questionable history as well. Those are valid points, and I understand it. But if it's not enough to get rid of the man as an owner, then it's not enough to refuse to work for him mm. if indeed you want to work in the fraternity that is the NBA. And it's just that simple. There is no way around it. I, that's just the way I look at it. You make many good points, but I still believe somebody involved with the Los Angeles Clippers over the last decade should have stood up and said enough. I'm not saying it had to be Doc or any of the current players, but somebody needed to say no. And a lot of people have written about this. Jamel Hill, your friend, has written about it. Yep. J.A. Donde has written about it. Where was the NBA and where was anyone involved with the Clippers? And Stephen A., I'm not trying to shift blame onto the victims of racism here. Mm -hmm. I'm simply asking why didn't somebody, either publicly or privately with the league, say, hey, this is out of hand. This is too much. Mm -hmm. We had such public testimony in the lawsuits against Sterling over the racist practices in his rental properties. Mm -hmm. we, we had such public, painful testimony from Elgin Baylor, whether he won or lost. It was still public testimony under oath, on the record. And we had public comments from Baron Davis about racist comments made to him by Donald Sterling. We had the great Phil Jackson saying before a 2010 game, against the then rival Clippers. How many incidents do we have on file, question mark? He was making fun of how nobody has called this man's hand on what was a, a growing mountain of evidence against him that culminated to me with that 2009 ESPN the Magazine piece, which was terrifically, powerfully done in, in painful detail about all of his past racial transgressions, racist transgressions. Mm -hmm. So. All that adds up to, Doc, didn't somebody, somebody, a player or a coach or, or an, even an executive, have the guts to stand up even privately to the league and say, where, where are you people? How do you let him operate like this? I, I, I don't think it's right for Bo Doc to shift the blame off Doc and off the players saying, well, don't blame us, we're the victims. Well, hey. You, you know your past in this country. Where would we be with racial progress if a whole lot of your forefathers hadn't stepped up and said, that's enough? Because it, it, there was enough evidence, public evidence there, without the, even this before the tape. I know the tape is right in your face. And you said, man, the tape is the one where you say, okay, I can hear him say it. I have to respond. Mm -hmm. But there was so much evidence on, you know, that was, was publicly... Um, transcribed in, in all the all the stories that, that were written about these lawsuits mm -hmm. why wouldn't somebody and doc could have been the leader of this why couldn't somebody have stepped up and said well, somebody needs to call this man well there's a couple of things and again we do this on this show and it is what it is because it's about we're gonna go into an uncomfortable territory here but so be it you open the floodgates I'm here with you all of your points are valid but let's keep a few things in mind Number one, the reputation of Donald Sterling outside of the media. Because, again, we want to applaud Jamel Hill and Bomani Jones mm -hmm. and folks like that who wrote about it and J.A. Mm -hmm. Adande. But what I'm saying is outside of the NBA community looking in, Donald Sterling was recognized, or really, really just inside as well, as notoriously and incredibly cheap. Racism wasn't the stuff that propped up. What he was known for being more than anything else until a few years ago was notoriously cheap. He was a miser. He was cheap with everybody. He was always looking to underpay. He was always looking for shortcuts. He always wanted to hold on to his money. 
It didn't matter what what your ethnicity was. Yep. He wanted to hold on to his money. He's the type of dude perceived as somebody that wanted to take the, take the money in the grave with him. Nobody was getting his money. That's number one. Number two, when we talk about why didn't anybody step up, how many times have I had to tell you, if we're going to sit there and point the finger at other people, we got to look in the mirror. Elgin Baylor may have made some very poignant arguments. What the hell were you working with him for 22 years for? It's very honest. 22 years. We ain't talking about a dude that was working for the guy for three to five years and then decided I couldn't take it no more yeah. and moved on. We're talking about a dude that worked for this man for 22 years. How many times have we sat up there and we asked Elgin Baylor, why are you with this man? How many times did Elgin Baylor have to take hits unfairly because we thought he was an incompetent GM because of the decisions Donald Sterling made him make and because he wanted to he wanted, right. he wanted to, to pocket pinch and all of this other stuff. We, we, we pointed this out. Elgin Baylor approached me one time because he didn't like what I had to say about him and was, and, and was and getting on me for not acknowledging what role Donald Sterling played. And I'm yeah. like... Well, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I wasn't aware that he was this bad. Yep. But, but, but Elgin didn't bring up racism then. He didn't bring up a slave plantation mentality then. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this man was working for him for 22 years. And then, of course, there's the Los Angeles chapter of the NAACP. By the way, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. I don't know if y'all know this, but colored people is kind of out of style. You might want to change that name just a little bit. Just thought I'd throw that out there because we don't say colored people anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just, just a thought. But having said all of that, you give this man the Lifetime Achievement Award, and then you're on the verge of getting ready to give it to him again May 15th. So the point that I'm trying to make to you is that when you have people, and again, I don't mean to call them out because I'm quite sure they didn't have malintent. And I'm not trying to take away the level of sensitivity or the hard work that Elgin Baylor has put in and what he deserves in terms of his name as a basketball player and what he has meant to the NBA community. I'm certainly not trying to diminish the, 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 the century-long exceptional sure. work for the most part that the NAACP has done as a foundation, as an organization. But when your local chapter essentially is on the record giving this man a pass, and Elgin P Vela, by his mere existence as an employee, is on the record giving this man a pass for decades, then it's, 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 it's incomprehensible for us to sit back and go like this. Maybe, just maybe, some of the problems that have been thrown out there about Donald Sterling, maybe all of it's not true. I'm saying if you're Doc Rivers, if you're the players, if you're the NBA, if you're a multitude of people, it is possible that you can think that some of the arguments against Donald Sterling at the time were a bit embellished because he had cover provided to him by people from our own community. Mm -hmm. That can't be escaped. That's a fair point. That can't be escaped. And what further and finally complicates this story is that Donald Sterling had long been a champion of diversity within his organization, hiring black GMs, black head coaches, black assistant coaches. Yeah. Now, you can question why that was. Was right. it plantation owner mentality? Yeah, maybe. It could yeah. be, especially, sure. especially sure. when you consider what sure. he was paying them compared to what they would have gotten okay. elsewhere. All right. So there's no question. But again, if you're providing him cover, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. if, 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 if we come on the airways every day as African-Americans and we're an apologist for anything that, that, that our white contemporaries dole out there, then it would be a problem because we're not representing in any way what, what is emanating from our own community. And I'm saying to you, we don't do that. But you can make a legitimate argument that some people did that when it came to Donald Sterling. Stephen they Hayes. gave him cover. So if they, the players, the coaches, if they did know, even though they said they didn't, do you believe they still would have played for him? I think that they would have played. They, they would have played because they worked for the NBA. If they could have gone somewhere else, they would have. But at the same time, if they had to take his check because there was nobody else that was going to give them that money, so be it. But not if you heard the audio tape. I think the kind of stuff that you heard about him prior to the audio tape, it was easy for somebody to say that's somebody else's problem. You're, you're a slumlord, a landlord. I don't like it. 
But is that going to stop me from collecting a, a $95 million or $107 million check? No, I might find a different way to make a difference as opposed to passing up those dollars. I think that's the position that most of them would have taken without the audio tape. With the audio tape, no, I don't think anybody would have played for it. Okay, last quick point. I hold the NBA, the other owners, mm -hmm. the front office, far more responsible for allowing Donald Sterling to continue to operate than I do Doc or any of the players. I would say That's the very owners. fair. I would say the okay. owners. The league office has to work for the owners. The other owners had the power right. to check Donald right. Sterling. And I would put away. it on them if, and if anybody. That's a fair point. Uh, the president of the Los Angeles chapter of the NAACP, resigned. Leon Jenkins, did resign. Yes, he needed to. There needs to be more to be done, though. You, you touched on that. That's another topic for another day. Good game, folks. Next, beat the Raptors by a point off a of Paul Pierce block shot to advance to the semis of the Eastern Conference. And it turns out this is the matchup we wanted to see. Next, Heats. You may remember Brooklyn swept the Heat. But keep these two things in mind. That's during the regular season. And Dwayne Wade didn't play in two of their four meetings. This is what Paul Pierce had to say. They're a different team in the playoffs. You know, they're confident. They've won two championships in a row. Uh, but, hey, series is like this that should that, that, that push you and push you to seven games, get you ready for the next round. So we're going to be battle-tested going into Miami, I think. Well, I break LeBron is one of the greatest players to ever play the game. I mean, a <clears throat> uh, tremendous athlete. I mean, a four-time MVP, two-time champion. Uh, he's already passed so many greats that we still talk about. Um, and when you play against the best, you know, as a competitor, uh, you want those moments. You want those moments. We want the series. Stephen A., who wins? Proud of the Brooklyn Nets. <clears throat> Proud of how they stepped up and handled their business in Game 7. This is the matchup I truly wanted because if Paul Pierce ever gets hyped to go up against anybody, it's LeBron James. KG did a good job yesterday, showed up in that Game 7 the way champions do, made his contribution. Darren Williams has got to step up, missed the front end of the one-on-one, -on -one, I believe, late in that game. I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. He's got to make that shot. But Sean Livingston came off the bench dry, uh, had, in, had shot a free throw in two games, and he hit those two big free throws, give a lot of credit to them. Um, but they're not the Miami Heat. Having a week off, rested, Dwayne Wade and his treatment, LeBron James getting much-needed rest. Um, and having beaten them all four times, you faced them in this regular season, Miami will be ready. Um, I believe that the Brooklyn Nets are going to be competitive. I think this series is going to be interesting. But I think in the end, the Miami Heat find a way to seal the deal. I'm going to show the Brooklyn Nets the respect that they deserve and give them two games. Okay. But I think Miami wins this game in six because – in the end, they have the greatest player in the world who knows how to close and who will have his closer with him in Dwayne Wade. And I think that will be too much. On too many occasions throughout this first round series, the Nets underwhelmed me. Mm. Um, there were times when they were incredibly impressive and there were times when they were a bit too anemic for my liking. Mm. You can't afford to be that way against the Miami Heat. They are not the Toronto Raptors. They have an identity. We know who their star is. We also know they've got snipers to feed off of because Dwayne Wade is still a superstar when he's healthy. Mm. And if he's healthy, he will show up and he will show up to close. And Ray Allen can still hit shots. And Shane Battier, who I believe is playing his last season, can hit shots. And Mario Chalmers can hit shots. I don't see Miami making the same young youthful mistakes that the Toronto Raptors made. And as a result, I see Miami closing this series in six games. Six games. I got to give you credit because maybe six weeks ago Called on the it. show, maybe two months ago, you started saying, beware the Brooklyn Nets. And I scoffed. I might even laughed at you a couple <laughs> times because you said the Miami Heat better be looking over their shoulder a little bit here because – they had already lost, probably at that point, three games in a row yep. to the Brooklyn Nets. Now it's four. I don't think that's any small thing to beat somebody four times. Even though it was by, I think, three times by a point, yep. you still beat them. Yep. And you know you can beat them. And yet, I'm with you. I watched them against Toronto thinking, Miami, Miami, Miami. Can you, can you, can you? I couldn't see it. Now, listen, 
Toronto's building something. Yes, they are. I'm not, I'm not going to go to special, but it's it's impressive what Dwayne Casey's doing with those those young kids. Kyle Lowry's not young anymore. He's bounced around, but man, he's he's, he's arrived. A, he's a he he's has a arrived. Load, man. He's a handful. Right. Paul Pierce is calling him an animal after the game. You right. know, like uh, they were scared of him. Yeah. The pit bull. Yeah. And I know Paul made the block of that shot, but but come on, Kyle lost the ball for yeah. a second. Yeah. He had to reach down and get it, and then yeah. just kind of shoot it from his feet up. Yeah. So it wasn't like. A towering, leaping sure. block. I bet it, it was a clean block, and it was a good save the game because knowing Kyle Lowry probably would have made it if the ball hadn't been touched by Paul Pierce. But I'm not sure it was a highly impressive block. Right. But still, I'm, I'm going to go with you on this. I'm still going to give Brooklyn two games. I would go farther, but Miami got a huge break in the first round when Al Jefferson could not go on his plantar fasciitis, and it only got worse the more he tried to play on it. So it gave them basically a first-round bye to me because by the fourth game, it was just like all bets are off. Right. And LeBron James said yesterday, uh, I hope I'm quoting him correctly, I'm the healthiest I've been since my honeymoon, and I believe that. That was crucial for both LeBron and Dwayne to get those days off. So they will be rested and ready to go in game one. And the, the, only, the only hope I give the Nets, that they do have an X factor now. Joe Johnson showed up in the playoffs. Really, for the first time in his career, where you said, hey, you can trust him. You know and I know. When that guy gets going, nobody can stop that. Johnson's special. Nobody. Johnson's special. Nobody. Go inside hey. and out. But more importantly, he can play with his back to the basket as well as he can play facing you up, which is a very, very huge thing for a team that really doesn't have much of a post game. Nope. He's your post game. And because of that, I think that makes him very, very formidable, and he's somebody to be reckoned with. So can LeBron James check him? Can he? Well, LeBron can check anybody. That's what I'm saying. LeBron but you can put LeBron anybody. on Joe. But, but the problem is, is that Joe is highly intelligent as a basketball player. He's very skilled at drawing fouls too. They threw a multitude of defenders his way. You know why? Because guys were either too small or too slow or unsavvy mm -hmm. to check him. Yeah, and that's that's the way Joe is. Joe can score over you. He can go up on. He can go under you. He can draw fouls, and he'll hit free throws. Joe is Joe is a low. I've just never known if he's made of the right stuff when it really, really counted. I th that's where the Paul Pierce and the KGs yep. of the world come in and deserve the boatload of credit that they they deserve. do. Yeah, because Important. those of you who have it in you. They'll pull it out of you, mm -hmm. which is why we have to keep our eyes on Darren Williams. Darren Williams can play some basketball, man. He truly can, which is why it's unacceptable. For him, three of eight from the field, you know, 13 points, four assists in 32 minutes. Yeah, the, the, the ankle's not 100%. And I give him that, and I'll give him a pass for that one. But Darren Williams is supposed to be the catalyst for this team. He has the easiest job of any franchise player in the league, maybe in league history, because when you've got the parts around him, you've got closers in Paul Pierce and Joe Johnson. Yep. You've got leadership in KG and Paul Pierce. You've got, I mean, guys that are great in the community and the other players, including Livingston and Plumlee and these boys. Yep. You have all he has to hey, do is play the way, game. Marcus Thornton can come off the bench and, by the way, and light by it the up. Way, he lit it up yesterday, Woo. 14 points in the first half. Listen, these guys, you've got players around you. So he's got to be that catalyst, which I believe he's capable of being. We'll see. I've never thought he was a max player. He's never lived up to that he has, contract. He hasn't lived up to being a max player. I still believe in his talent. I like him. I think he's strong mentally. But. He's got to play. He Against Miami, somebody's got to be a star. Yeah. Somebody's got to be a star. Or Paul Pierce has to get in LeBron's head, which he's done before. And he can do that. LeBron's Game team. one in Miami, Tuesday, 7 Eastern. Is it official or is it not official? It's official. Because you'll be there. No, not tomorrow. I'll probably go to game two, but okay. I need to be here. And Thank with you. Us? I'll be here. I appreciate Aww. that. That means we're going to be official tomorrow. Oh, okay. We're going to count. Oh, we're going to count tomorrow. Yeah. Don't roll I'll your always eyes. always count. Okay. I'm on the show. Yeah. Don't roll your eyes. Just give us some love. Well, everyone has something to say about one Johnny Manziel, including University of Texas defensive coordinator Vance Bedford, who seemingly took a shot at Johnny Manziel on Twitter over the weekend. He wrote, Manziel is a top ten pick by the scouts. I wish him the best. He played backyard ball for three years. Now he will learn. He, now he will have to learn how to be a quarterback. He later tweeted that, he wasn't taking a shot at Manziel, not one bit. Joining us now is our draft expert, Mel Kuyper. Uh, Mel Kuyper, let me ask you this. Thanks for being here, first off. And let me ask you this. Do you think that Vance Bedford 
has a point about Mandel? You know, it is what it is, Gary. We've been saying all for, I guess, five months now, he is an improvisational quarterback. I said it's going to be Sunday afternoon at the Improv with starring Johnny Manziel. So what anything Vance Bedford said is what we've been saying for months. That's the kind of quarterback Johnny football is. Will he be able to adapt to throw from the pocket, not move out of the pocket as soon as he sees somebody coming to the left or coming to the right? That's why there's no guarantees. That's why nobody really knows for sure, Kerry, how he will project to the NFL. Even those who love Johnny Manziel can't be definitively positive with that exclamation point that it'll be great. And those that question him are scared to death that he's going to come back to haunt them. So to me, uh, he's a very difficult evaluation because no scheme fits him. You have to fit what he does into what you believe in. That makes it a little tricky. Uh, Mel, before we get give it to you and Skip to go back and forth the way I know y'all will, mm. I've got to ask you this. Did you take it as a shot against Manziel or Kevin Sumlin? Because when I read the, the tweet, it, I, I thought it was more about how he was being coached than about Johnny Manziel himself. You know, I don't read anything into this stuff, uh, you know, Stephen, just okay. because it is what it is. And it, I, I don't see why there's a need to do this on Twitter. I, it, I don't get it. I think too much is out there. Keep stuff private, your opinions, keep them to yourself, where you create this type of so-called controversy. I don't read anything into it. I think what Coach Bedford said is exactly the kind of quarterback Johnny Manziel is. I don't think it was a shot at Manziel or Kevin Sumlin, in my opinion. I think it was just, hey, his evaluation, which we've been saying, hey, now he's got to learn how to be a quarterback in the NFL, and that's true. You can't do what, ha what he did at A&M and apply that to the NFL. It ain't going to work. So at the end of the day, everything he said is exactly what the questions are and what we've been saying for three, four, five months right now. Mel, it is, Skip, and, and I do want to <laughs> go back and forth for just a second on this. Mm -hmm. I covered Vance Bedford when he played for the University mm -hmm. of Texas. Y you remember him? He's a yep. very good defensive back, didn't go until mm -hmm. the fifth round, but he was a defensive captain. I'm sure he bleeds orange. We know there's been some bad blood between the University of Texas and Texas A&M because the school that Johnny wanted to go to growing up, he wanted to be a Longhorn, go to UT, did not want him, at least as a quarterback. All right. So now let's get back to fair or unfair. There is one stat that sticks in my craw here, and tell me what you think, Mel. Johnny Manziel, from the pocket last year, had the highest com completion percentage of any power conference quarterback, 73% from the pocket. I think he's getting a bad rap as a backyard quarterback because I think he threw very well from the, in fact, very well from the pocket last year. He did, Skip, and that's the thing. If he can just get into that comfort zone and realize you don't have to move out every time you see somebody flying by to your side, to either side, and then basically be more patient and wait for that second, third, fourth option to come open. That's going through progressions. That's playing quarterback in the NFL. It's something he'll learn, hopefully, and he also has to obviously learn to not run around as much and protect that body for durability purposes. So I think we all know what needs to be, what questions need to be answered. And if Johnny can answer those questions positively, he'll be Fran Tarkings. And if he can't, he'll be injured a lot and be a disappointment. So really, I think the ball's in Johnny Manziel's court to do the things necessary to be an NFL quarterback. What worked at A&M will not work in the NFL. These guys are too fast, too athletic. They'll track him down. He's not a 4-4 guy. He's a 4-6 guy, and these guys can run faster than he can. So, Mel, any quick update on Johnny's stock? Have you heard anything new that we should be aware of? Skip, you talk to people in the league as I did this weekend, and your head's still spinning. Some really like them, some don't. That's just the way it's going to be. You're not going to get a consensus. And that's the thing about these mock drafts that we're all doing. Unless you know the decision maker, and he's going to tell you who they're taking, we're just guessing. Okay, it's just a guess, guessing game, and the guessing game continues up until Thursday night. And at that point, we'll know. And you pencil them in, and yeah, that's why you know you got to wait and see. I think the anticipation of build up is great. The fact that we don't know is great, unless somebody out there feels like they do. I don't. I don't know if Todd does, but the bottom line is, I think the mystery surrounding this draft, even the number one pick overall, is is great because that adds to, like I say, the build up, the anticipation. Because hey. If you know what's uh, you know, under the Christmas tree and you know what the presents are before Christmas morning, is there any, that, that build up of anticipation? No. And that's the same with the draft coming up on Thursday. All right. Let the guessing game continue. Last week, uh, Clemson coach Davo Sweeney told a Bay Area radio station, 95.7, the game, that passing on Sammy Watkins would be like passing on Michael Jordan. Huge comparison, Mel. What do you think about the coach's comparison? 
I didn't really read it in. I, I, I read it as this, Kerry. He says, hey, my guy's a great player. If teams are going to pass on him and take an offensive line and say Greg Robinson at St. Louis over Sammy Watkins, I didn't even say names. I'm just throwing those names in there, that, that they'll, they'll regret that because Sammy will be a touchdown maker and a great player, similar to what happened with Michael Jordan. Not a real big deal. I mean, Sammy Watkins could be to the NFL, you know, to certainly what a great player like Michael Jordan was to the NBA. In today's NFL, where cornerbacks don't really like to tackle, and they have to with Sammy Watkins, and he'll run you over. Uh, yeah, his, his game translates very effectively to today's NFL, and that's his coach. His, before the draft, if your head coach isn't going to say uh, these tremendously positive things, then I don't know who will. Now, where, you know, regardless of, 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 you know, where they are in the draft in terms of where they pick, what do you think will be the ideal landing spot for Sammy Watkins? You know, really anywhere. I mean, he's a wide receiver. Uh, yeah, he could go anywhere and be fine. I mean, whether it's you know Jacksonville at three seems like a good spot. St. Louis, if they want a number one, even though they like Stedman Bailey and they drafted Tavon Austin High, they could go that route over the offensive tackle. So really, St. Louis, Jacksonville. Now, Bradford's still a question mark. What kind of quarterback he'll be coming off the injury? And of course, he had his up and down moments. And then you look at Jacksonville with Chad Henney. Who do they draft? So, in that scenario, it's better to be at St. Louis than Jacksonville. Then you get down to Cleveland. If he's there for Cleveland, I think they pretty much have to take him. But they have a quarterback issue with Hoyer coming off the injury. Oakland's got Shaw, but is he great? No. So, really, these teams are picking early guys because they don't have a big time quarterback. And Sammy Watkins needs a quarterback to get him the football. So, boy, any of those teams, you're in a similar predicament until the quarterback play improves the wide receiver is not going to be spectacular so mel put it in perspective for us can sammy watkins at what is he about six feet one inch tall have mm -hmm. calvin johnson or larry fitzgerald kind of impact in the nfl well, he can, but because well, yeah, Skip, when he get, gets the hands on the ball, whenever he is in the open field after the catch, he's better than anybody. I mean, that's where he's at his best. He is a beast to try to tackle in the open field. He'll run you over. He'll lower the pad level, and he'll become a running back, a powerhouse running back. And that's something the cornerbacks in the NFL don't want to have to deal with. So I think from that standpoint, you know, if he was 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 uh, you know, then you'd say, yeah, he could be. The size is the only thing that he doesn't have that Megatron has and Larry Fitzgerald has. Now, he's more explosive than Larry. Megatron's in a separate category. Calvin Johnson's spectacular. That's why he went where he did. But in terms of, uh, of Sammy Watkins, I think with his powerful style with the ball in his hands, uh, yards after the catch, he'll probably lead the league. So, Mel, you, you would have no issue if St. Louis took Sammy Watkins number two in the draft. No, not at all, because let's face it, all those offensive tackles, they're not perfect. Greg Robinson could be spectacular two to three years down the road, but he still has to learn the art of pass protection, which is what this league's all about. So when you think about Greg Robinson, yes, he could be, and I've raved about him all year, but he's not perfect. That's why, yeah, if you took Watkins at two over Robinson, nobody could argue with you. You took Robinson over Watkins, nobody's going to sit there and say, wow, that's a mistake. Those two guys have great talent. Although Watkins right now is better, Robinson three years from now could be the best left tackle in the NFL. All right, Mel Kuyper Jr., T-minus three days before you mm -hmm. get no sleep, right? Carrie, it's been that way for a couple months now. We just want to <laughs> tee this thing up and get it going. All right. Thank you so much for joining see us. We'll see you Take in a couple care. of days. All right, buddy. The next big thing. The next new kid, the next overnight sensation, the next rookie, one to watch, the next Hall of Famer, the next Intimidator, the next six time, the next king, next, next, next. Who's next? Let's find out. Names are made here. The History 300 at Charlotte, Saturday at 2.30 Eastern on ABC. Manning made a special visit to his friend Derek Jeter at Yankee Stadium yesterday. Uh, Manning says he wanted to pay his respects to the captain before he retired. So that got us to thinking, as we often do on this show, who has had the better career as they both reached the end of their careers, respectively? Stephen A. Smith. You know, this is a great question. It's a great question. It's a barbershop who debate. Who came up with this question? I, oh, I don't. I, I haven't even asked the question. Do you guys see what he's doing? Do you see this face? I don't, Jeter or Peyton? That's all I ask. <laughs> did you put them up to this? You know he did. Well, you know the producers, he did. Did, did, did Skip put y'all up to this? He did. Really? Mm -hmm. This is a question? Uh-huh. El Capitan, <laughs> Derek Jeter, one of the greatest shortstops who have ever lived, 
3,339 hits. Mm -hmm. You're talking about hits. You're talking about bad and average. You're talking about the five-time champion that Derek Jeter is. Mm -hmm. This is a question? Mm -hmm. This is a question? Yes. Statement. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay. I have nothing but respect for Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. The greatest regular season quarterback in history. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history. Yep. A man who I believe if he sticks around for a couple of more seasons <clears throat> will eclipse will eclipse Brett Favre mm -hmm. as an all-time leading passer. Keep talking. Okay? Yep. I get all of that. You're going. You're but he right is track. not a five time champion. No. That would happen to be Derek Jeter. Mm -hmm. El Capitan, a leader on the greatest sports franchise in history, mm -hmm. by the way, in the New York Yankees. Mm -hmm. 27 World Series championships. Did you hear what I just said, Skip? 27. Mm -hmm. Now, wait, and, wait. And, you can't credit those to Derek Jeter. That's not the point. Okay. The point is the, tra the tradition, the standard, the things that were established long before he ever came along. Mm -hmm. He has not only held true to, he has uplifted, he has elevated. Okay? He is Derek Jeter, and you will not speak about him on this show disrespectfully. I swear to you, I'm going to get some water, I'm going to throw it at you. You better watch what you say. Now, I respect Peyton Manning. I truly do. I respect him to the core. But when you talk about champions, when you talk about leaders, you talk about one man above most, and his name is Derek Jeter. You better watch your tongue. I'm telling you, you better be respectful. And if I, I swear to you, I better not find that these producers up in there put you up to this, Skip Bayless. I better not find that you, Kerry, put them up to this. I'm, I'm trying here. to tell you right now, you better watch. You better be respectful. Don't be disrespectful. I'm telling you. Okay, now I'm going to tell you. Yeah, you're <laughs> I have nothing, nothing but respect for Derek Jeter. All right. Because he deserves nothing but respect. Okay. But this okay. is a valid question, which oh, I did is. come up with today. I came up with this because you know what? Somebody needs to be objective when it comes to Derek Jeter no. on this show. That would be you. That would be me. Because no, Peyton Manning has not nearly as many rings as Derek Jeter does, we all know that. And Peyton Manning stunk it up in his last appearance in the Super Bowl, and I'm trying to forget about that right now, so I don't even want to talk about it because, to use all your terms, beat down, what are all your... Punked. Punked, punked straight up punked. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Now, let's look at Derek Jeter's career. All-time great postseason player. But I must tell you, in all objectivity... I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, looking, looking back at the resume, and I see only one ring in the last 14 years for Derek Jeter. Only one ring in 14 years. And that was one in 2009. Well, how many rings does Peyton Manning have? Hold on, hold on. I'm trying to put this in perspective. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound that way to In 2009, that's the only aberration here over the last 14 years. Alex Rodriguez caught crazy fire, thanks to Kate Hudson. Remember Kate yeah. Rod and all that? Yep. Alex Rodriguez carried that team through that postseason. Hideki Matsui was the MVP of that World Series. Really, a, a, a close MVP was CC Sabathia, who carried them pitching through that World Series. And Derek Jeter had one single solo RBI through that World Series. That's his only ring in the last 14 years. Now, Mr. Yankee fan, can I refresh your memory going back to the 2000 New York Yankee team? Do you remember what Derek Jeter was surrounded by? Can we talk about the pitching staff on that 2000 team? Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, David Cohn, El Duque, not to mention closing Mariano Rivera. That's some all-time greatness right there. Can I, can I refresh you about after Derek in the batting order? We had Bernie Williams, we had Paul O'Neill, we had David Justice, Posada, Tino Martinez, Brosius. I could go on and on. He was surrounded by greatness. Now let's look at, what did I say? Brosius? Yes. I said Brosius. Brosius. I, I, I said Brosius. All right, go ahead. Yeah. I thought it was Brosius, but go ahead. What, 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 what are we doing? What are Somebody's talking in my ear. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, now back to Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. After a 3-13 and 13 start for, for not the New York Yankees, the Indianapolis Colts, who had fallen basically into right. oblivion. 
over the next 12 seasons in Indianapolis, Peyton Manning averaged 11.5 wins per year, which made me proclaim him, before he ever left Indy, the greatest regular season quarterback ever. 11.5. He was not surrounded by New York Yankees. He did have Marvin Harrison. He did have later Reggie Wayne. But those weren't the Yankees around him. <laughs> it was pretty much Peyton or bust. And Peyton Manning carried the day. He was not great in the postseason. He was pretty good, but he never quite lived up to his regular season greatness in the postseason. Then what's he do? He goes to Denver and he goes 13 and 3, 13 and 3. <clears throat> he should have been the NFL MVP both of those years. Adrian Peterson won it two years ago. I didn't think he should have, but Peyton did win it last year. That's two years in a row with MVP caliber seasons. Sure. That is greatness, man. That, that is resume that continues to build at age 37, 38, going on Derek Jeter at 39. That, he is catching up to Derek Jeter, and I think he's passed him in overall oh, grade. Stop it. In overall Stop grade. it. One that is ring. ridiculous. One ring in 14 years. Hit, one ring. Peyton has one ring. Whoa. Okay. okay. Peyton's got one ring. Yeah. He's played in three Super Bowls. Let me tell you something. He's got one ring. Derek Jeter has five. Okay, I <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on. Let me know. You have to go back to 2000. Derek, Derek, Jeter, Derek Jeter's first year, first year, when he was in a World Series in 1996, Skip Bayless, uh -oh. This man batted 412 in his first playoff series, 4 417 in his second playoff series. When they won the World no. Series, Skip, against San Diego in 1998, he batted 450. And when they won the World Series, when they won the World Series against Atlanta, he batted. No, no, baseball is an individual sport too. Now I'm talking about his performances. He batted 353 in the postseason, Skip Bayless. In 2009, when A Rod caught fire, he batted. 400 in the ALDS against Minnesota. He batted 407 in the World Series against the Philadelphia Phillies. It doesn't matter whether it's the 90s, whether it's mid to late 2000s. It's ancient it history matter. now. <laughs> it's ancient history. It's the 90s we're, we're talking, talking about. about. We're talking about career. Peyton's still we're going. Talking, oh, we're talking about career. career. We're talking about career. The fact of the <laughs> matter is, Peyton, Derek Jeter produces. Produce you too. Excuse me. Too. Excuse me. <sighs> the Yankees haven't won a World Series in a few years. Okay. A few. No, that's right. Since 2009. Okay. Not and before not, that. Not just Derek. 2000. Not the. Not just <clears throat> Derek Jeter. And when they performed, he performed. This man has five rings. Five. He was the leader, El Capitan, oh. in the media capital yeah. of the world. Uh -huh. We had a bubble. I mean, you you sit there. You don't know anything. Do you realize? You know, I mean, I barely remembered. I barely remembered. I barely remembered that Peyton Manning is the wonderful person and the wonderful family that he has. I barely remember the man was married with kids. Derek Jeter, he's on the tabloids. Everybody trying to get all up in his business. He's in New York City. He's in that bubble. On top of it all, he's representing the New York Yankees, and he's still produced. Don't give me anything about Peyton Manning compared to Derek Jeter. Five times. He's got a ring for the thumb. Five time Wait, champion. So, so help me out here. Does Roger Clemens, PEDs or no, belong in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, he sure he does. Yeah. Come on. Does Pettit belong in the Hall of Fame? I I'll bet he'll wind up in the Hall of Fame. Does David Cohn belong? Come on. He's surrounded by greatness. Everywhere you look Excuse in the lineup, it's me. greatness. There is never any. Listen, parody exists all over football, and nobody is questioning the greatness of Peyton Manning as a quarterback. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are times where Mr. Big Tom himself with that team were expected to go over the hump, and it didn't happen. The Yankees have five rings to show for their collective effort. The fact is, Peyton Manning should have had more than one. He didn't. You know why? Because as much as I respect him, oh. he is not El Capitan. Mm, okay. So That's El all Capitan, I'm trying to say that. One ring in 14 years. Have you not I, lost a little objectivity there? Excuse me. I have. I will. I will admit right here on national television. When it comes to one man and I one do. man Thank only, you. I have no objectivity. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. That man is yes, El Capitan. Yes. Yes. Derek Jeter. Yes. 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 Derek Jeter. But that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Excuse me. If, if, if Excuse objectivity me. was about being wrong, <laughs> you'd be wrong about Tebow, Manziel, Derek Jones, Excuse me. Uh, Excuse me. Jones Excuse me. Uh, everybody. Excuse me. I have nothing but objectivity about all of them. You don't have objectivity about LeBron either. Oh boy. So I can say that Derek Jeter has had the better career off the field, is what you were saying. Well, I wouldn't say that. I mean, Tabloid. Derek, Derek, Derek girlfriend. Manning's a happy, happy man. Okay. Uh -huh. I'm just saying. You just it's saying. a lot more to deal with if you're Derek Jeter. Mm. He's got five rings. Okay. Five. One for the thumb. Five.
Viciviano, the 31-year-old at the center of the Donald Sterling re revelation, spoke with Barbara Walters about Sterling. She was asked, was he a racist, and what exactly is her relationship with him? Let's listen. I'm Mr. Sterling's right-hand arm man. I'm Mr. Sterling everything. I'm his confidant, his best friend, his silly rabbit. His what? His silly rabbit. His silly rabbit? Yes. Is that what he calls you? No. That's I call myself that. I see. Okay. I joke around and I make him laugh. I do things that some people find very silly or I do things that sometimes people can understand our relationship. I'm his everything. She's his right hand arm man. Stephen A, your reaction? <clears throat> I will preface my comments by saying to all the ladies out there in America, I am not talking about women. I am talking about her. Okay. Specifically Let's her. Let's be clear. She's trifling. Okay. Let me put that out there right now. She's trifling. The woman, I don't care what anybody says, obviously taped the conversation or allowed somebody that she knows <laughs> to have taped <clears throat> the conversation. Whether directly or indirectly, she had to have something to do with how it ultimately got out. Now, denigrating and excoriating Donald Sterling for his, to be kind, questionable tendencies is one thing. To sit here and look at her as some kind of respectable woman with just the greatest of intentions, um, it, 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 it definitely, it, that ain't happening. Let's just put it that way. It wouldn't surprise me at all to see her with her own reality TV show sometime in the near future because that's just the world that we're living in. It wouldn't surprise me at all to see her profit from all of this. Um, what did she call herself? His, 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 what is it? What the right? Right hand arm man. Right hand arm man and, uh -huh. you know, tricks for, trick, you know, she's, she's a silly, silly rabbit. She's a silly rabbit. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but that's from the tricks, uh, cereal yeah, commercial sure. back from years ago. I don't even know if she was old enough to know that right. commercial was out there at that particular time. You know, they talked about how tricks were for kids. Well, <sighs> clearly it's not. But in the end, what it comes down to is very, very simple. She had malintent and to sit before Barbara Walters as if she was sincere and she cares and she has only his best interest at heart is an absolute joke. Now, that doesn't absolve him from anything. But what I do think it does is serve as a warning for an abundance of men out there, particularly those in the public eye. You got to watch what you say. You got to watch who you're saying it with. And under no circumstances should you automatically believe wholeheartedly 100% that the people that you allow to be in your inner circle have your best interest at heart. Because clearly, as she has illuminated, that is not the case. I think to say anything else that I'm yeah, feeling yeah. would be a bit risky. Yeah, risky. I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah, I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> Let's yeah. do that. I think people who look at me, see me on TV, and know me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Get where I'm coming from. I really don't need okay. to go any further than mm. that, Skip and Kerry. I'm only assuming that Barbara Walters initially wanted to talk to Donald Sterling. Okay. And what I heard. I, for one, wish that Donald had spoken because I would love to hear him speak at this point. V. Stiviano, or whatever she now calls herself because she's changed her name countless times. I wonder why. I've read. Yeah is now enjoying her 15 minutes of fame, and I hope they last about nine minutes. Right. I, I think she was auditioning for her book deal or her reality show in the Barbara Walters interview, which, which seemed terribly scripted on her part. And she forgot her line, yeah. I'm, I'm his, right? What was I supposed to say? Right, right hand. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And it was just pathetic to me, hard for me to watch. And I, I hope she goes away fairly quickly, knowing our society that we live in, she won't go away that quickly. 
and I fear we'll all be having to comment on her new reality show that you speak of, if not her book deal and the, the explosive revelations in her, her book deal. But again, she illegally recorded a conversation, if we're to believe she did record it. I don't know that for a fact, but I assume that's the case. Should be investigated. Yeah. And it was, in the state of California, illegal to tape someone without their knowledge. So we know that's where it started. And she has been sued by Shelley Sterling. We won't get into it, but it's right. the community property that Shelley sure. claims is half hers. So... Um, it was just pathetic to the point that I really would, I would encourage Donald Sterling to speak now. Maybe you could say he could only do himself harm speaking, but it would be, it, it's so, I, I brought this point up one week ago today. Nine days ago, nine days ago, I could not have picked, now you knew him because you, you happened to schmooze with him a little bit on the sideline. From a distance, I did not know what Donald Sterling looked like. Now he's public enemy number one, so I know what he looks like, so now... He, he wanted to be famous all along, and he, he wasn't famous. Nobody really cared who he was outside of Los Angeles. I don't even think they cared in L.A. who he was. So now, yeah, for, the wrong I, 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 for the wrong reasons, correctly. But now I would love to hear him try to put in perspective his attitudes toward the black community and the black race. I would just like to oh, hear it. And please, you talk about Jerry Jones or well, whatever, me wanting that interview. Yeah, I passed hey, it up in a heartbeat for this now one. with Donald okay. Sterling. I'd now that, love, now I'd, that I would pay to see. Yeah, that's that's pay-per-view television. Whoa. I'd that's pay-per-view I'd television. pay way more than I paid for Floyd I'd love, yes. Donald I'd Donald. love to go. I'd love to sit down with Donald Whew. Sterling and ask him the to explain something. is out there, Donald. Oh, yes, you could work that out. That, right. that offer, Donald, this is your there. man. Right Gentlemen, here. let me say this. I will add this to what you're saying. This Siviano character, she reminds me of the women who live in Los Angeles or come to Los Angeles looking to be famous, as you said, mm -hmm. an actress, a model, capitalizing off of what she looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's unfortunate because you both alluded she to grew this. Up there. Yeah, she, but went to the, Donald she just reminds school. me of those type I of agree. girls who capitalize off of what they yeah. look like, and perhaps she will be rewarded. And that is a sad commentary on our society. You guys are right on point on that. Um, Donald Sterling, Stephen A. is available for the interview. If in fact, not <laughs> happening, it'll you never happen. It. He ain't that brave. Well, according to USA Today Sports, Clippers guard J.J. Reddick says he was exposed to Sterling's ways, as we will call them, when he was trying to do his deal. It was a four-year, $27 million deal that nearly fell apart. Here's what Reddick had to say about the reasonings behind it. I've been told both ways. One, that he didn't want me to pay me because I was white and that he didn't want to pay me because I was a bench player. So he didn't want to pay him because he was white, Stephen A., and because he was a bench player. Your reaction? J.J. Reddick's absolutely correct. He's telling the truth. It's something that's been out there for quite some time. It's something that I believe I reported months ago. Um, after Doc Rivers took the job, if you remember, there is a window between when you can talk to the players and reach an agreement during free agency in the early part of July, and then ultimately when the signing period is allowed, you can sign. Doc Rivers had a handshake agreement with J.J. Reddick and his representatives. He was on board, um, and in the aftermath of that, Donald Sterling picked up the phone and called Doc Rivers and told Doc Rivers he didn't want J.J. Reddick, uh, purportedly because uh, his ethnicity was one part, because he looked at the league being black, athletic, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. and feel like J.J. Reddick didn't fall under that category. And he didn't care what Doc Rivers had agreed to, even though he had just given Doc Rivers the job and gave him authority to make those kind of decisions. Doc Rivers stood firm. Uh, his belief not only that was J.J. Reddick a quality guy, which he is, because J.J. Reddick is a great guy, and he's also a sharpshooter. We know what his role was coming out of Duke. This dude could, re he, you know, he's a gunner. He can put it up. And can I say real quick, yes. he made a big jump shot and two big free throws down That's the stretch. Right. The That's other right. Yeah. He's Just a guy. J.J. Reddick, I've always said this from the time he came into the league, you want him on your team. Right. You just do. He's just that, he's a, he's a talented shooter. He knows his role. And he plays it. And, um, you know, so Doc Rivers, the reason why Donald Sterling backed off, according to my sources, Doc Rivers threatened to quit. Mm. He was going to leave. Over J.J. Reddick. Well, he was going to quit. It wow. wasn't just over J.J. Reddick. It's over the principle of giving your word right. and keeping it. And also making sure that Donald Sterling honored his word wow. and the authority he gave Doc. So Doc was going to walk away and was going to quit unless J.J. Mm. Reddick. Uh, unless his deal with J.J. Reddick was honored. It's powerful. And, and, that, and that is what happened. Um, but I say all of that to say, without naming any names, there are a plethora of coaches that are a bit reticent 
about bringing on white players. Mm -hmm. Not because when you look at how athletic the league sure. is, they look at these guys I, and they say, what role can they play? But J.J. Redick can shoot. So when you can shoot and you have a high basketball IQ, those things play well. But then the Dirk Nowitzki's of the world come along and they debunk that and, you know, a plethora of other guys. And, and, and you know, even when Larry Bird came into the league and all of that, so you remember the whole Rodman, Isaiah Thomas mm -hmm. controversy, whatever, because you had certain players that had those questions because of how guys were ballyhooed. But today's coaches are far more sophisticated than that. Here's the thing. It's not about your ability to run and jump or whatever the case may be. The reason why they tend, and they're, ne they're never going to acknowledge this, but the reason why they tend to lean towards a lot of African-American players is not just because of their ability, but because of their hunger. Sure. When you come from different segments of our society and you're relatively well off, it's one thing nobody's going to ever, everybody that goes into the league for the most part works hard, and they put forth a valiant effort. But it's just like a boxer getting into the ring. It's one thing when you're reliant strictly upon your skill. It's another thing entirely when your family and your well-being and your quality of life is at stake. Yeah. When you don't have that concern, the level of fire inside of your belly to succeed is deemed as being somewhat short mm. compared to those who are starving for the success. So it's not just simply about ethnicity. We point to that because from a socioeconomic perspective, obviously you have a lot of black folks in America that struggle considerably more than most white folks in America. But at the same time, it's not that they're choosing black over white or anything like that. They're looking at a guy that isn't necessarily starving like that mm -hmm. compared to somebody who is. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the kind of pl a, a player they want on their roster. Okay. And that's where it comes from, more so than ethnicity. But there have been some coaches that look at it and they say, that's why I would okay. prefer the black player. To your point, and in fairness to Donald Sterling, let's remember, he had just sunk five years and $52 million into a Chris Kamen who had not come okay. close to living up to said contract. So he had been scorched by that one, and he's saying, wait a second, and J.J. was quoted in USA Today today as saying, it may have been because I'm white, or it may have been because I was a bench player. Remember, he was not a starter in his, what, seven years in Orlando? Not a starter. So, so Doc is saying, yes, let's give, what was it, 28 million for, uh, I'm sorry, 27 million for four years yep. to a J.J. Redick who's not been a starter in the league because, by golly, I'm going to start him. Because we need that. We need that offside shooter. That's sort of Steve Kerr, kind of not that Steve Kerr was a starter for the Bulls, but that's what Doc knew that team needed was some sharpshooter to take a little pressure off Blake and DeAndre that's inside. Right. Okay, so Doc knew what he was doing, and Doc was dead on right because, hey, J.J. has been really good. He had his back issue for I a while. I don't believe you win this series against the okay. Warriors without J.J. Redick. Okay, now. Just so I don't come across as a hypocrite, you know I've taken the position several times in the past on this show before NBA drafts saying, gee, I'm just being honest about it. I look back at the long history of overdrafted American players in this league. Mostly I'm talking about seven-foot-plus players that they've been drafted too high and rarely, if ever, have lived up to their draft spot. And remember a couple of years back we were stuck on Myers Leonard before he went in his draft. And he was going, he was projected in the top 10. And I said, no, you can't. And Portland took him 11th. And where is he now? Right. He's on Portland's bench. He averaged 8.9 minutes a game this year. And in the first round series against the Rockets, he played zero minutes. So let's just put that in perspective. And before the Adam Morrison draft, I said, no, wrong. And Michael Jordan was really wrong about that. Before Jimmer Fredette's, you know, face of college basketball draft, I said, no. He can't play. Not not at that. He can't be a starter or a star in this league. And now he's wound up from Sacramento to the Bulls bench. Okay, fine. So let's. Donald Sterling may have different motivations for. I'm just trying to be objective about it. Now the European-born or the South American-born, what would you call them, Caucasian players? 
that's a whole other story because they might come with a different mentality and a different skill level than some of the American kids. It's more so the mentality yeah. than anything else, and I stand by my previous explanation. Yeah. But I do think to piggyback off of what you said and to support what you said to some degree, the fact of the matter is when you look at some of the rule changes that have taken place in recent memory um, and, and, and some of the things that have been stipulated to soften up the game, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to lead more, to assist more in the sure. fluidity of an offense. Yeah. Of mindset and what have you, you've had a lot of people in the black community complaining that the objective was to lighten the hue of the NBA, Maybe. whether it be yeah. using the European players to come on board or whatever the case may be because you didn't want just a league full of black players. Uh, but, but at the same time, it's pretty hard to make that case. I'm just acknowledging that it's okay. a suspicion that emanates from the community, but at the same time, it's pretty hard to sit there and look at the NBA and say emphatically that that is the case because the NBA, led by Commissioner Stern, has done a phenomenal job of promoting a league that's about 80% black. They don't shy away from it. They embrace it. And, you know, you look at the LeBrons and the Kevin Durants and others, and they're like, please, we don't care about this. Look at these guys. They're fantastic individuals that represent our sport well. So we can't accuse that of having okay. veracity to it, but it is. it has to be acknowledged that there are people have felt. Okay, bottom line, given Donald Sterling's recent racist comments, put into perspective what you believe his motivation would be to say, I don't want white players. Mm. Well, I think that, you know, he may fall along the lines of when, you, when you're bringing women into the locker room and you're encouraging, according to the allegations that have been levied against him, and when you're encouraging black players in the locker room not to get dressed, and you're telling women, look at these beautiful mm -hmm. black Adonises mm -hmm. and stuff like yep. that, and, and, you, and you listen to Baron Davis and other people allude to him having the slave plantation mentality, mm -hmm. whether that be a Baron Davis or whether that be an Elgin Baylor, what it, what it lends itself in terms of thinking towards is, you know what, obviously he feels about black folks that, you know, they're, they're laborers, and he doesn't necessarily, he ain't necessarily comfortable with somebody who's not black coming across as a laborer mm. that's the mentality that he gives off uh, so it's tonight kids Wizards will go against the Pacers game one this will be the first time the two franchises have met in postseason but the Pacers have won 12 straight home games versus the Wizards I don't necessarily know if that matters Stephen A who wins the, ser the series darling? Skip Bayless I gotta tell you I've been waiting all year long for an Indiana Pacers Miami Heat Eastern Conference Finals. I, I got to roll with the Wizards. I think the Wizards are going to beat the Indiana Pacers. I, I just, I just, I'm looking at Wall. I'm looking at Bradley Beal. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the combination of Nene and, and Mark Gortat. I'm, I'm looking at a Trevor Reza, Trevor Reza. and I'm just, Ooh, saying, I'm just saying to myself, you know, if you're Indiana, the way to beat them is to make them utilize their bench because I'm not sold on Washington's yeah. bench, but I'm sold on those starters. And the way the Wizards have been looking, if Nene can keep his head and don't get ejected, mm -hmm. which I'm not worried about, by the way, yeah. I guarantee you he ain't going to head he and again. put his hands around David yeah. West's head. I guarantee you won't do that. Not to David West. Yep. But... As much as I love those brothers as people, mm -hmm. I got to admit to you, I just have this feeling, the Wizards and Six. Yes. I, I just think the Wizards and Six. Wow. So you're off to see the Wizards. He's off right? to see the Wizards. I, I think He's the Wizards it. are going to be He's on the Wizards. I just think they are. You know what? Slept on the Wizards, dude. I got to agree with you. I yeah. just wrote it down. Yep. Wizards and Six. Yep. You know why? Because in Game 7 the other day, the Atlanta Hawks missed 33 threes. Think about that. They missed 33 threes. If they just hit three more, they right. lost by 12. Yeah. Right. Four more. I don't know. It could have been a whole different story. They couldn't buy a three. So I, I'm not sold on Indiana, and I don't think Indiana's sold on Indiana, which brings us back to the Wizards, who I think are very sold on what they've become. Well, who would have thunk it? We slept on the Wizards. We owe you guys a big, huge apology. Wizards and six, so says the gents. For Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith, I'm Carrie Champion. Join us tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern, on ESPN2. Happy single de Mayo. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Tomorrow, actor David Allen Greer will join us at the desk. And you can catch First Take Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific, on ESPN2. The next big thing. The next new kid. The next overnight sensation. The next rookie. One to watch. The next Hall of Famer. The next intimidator. The next six-time the next king.
Next. 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 Who's next? Let's find out. Names are made here. The History 300 at Charlotte. Saturday at 2.30 Eastern on ABC.